What's going on? It's Keyshawn, and welcome to my show, Undisputed Presents All Facts and No Breaks Podcast. Joining me today from Las Vegas is an L.A. native and a Super Bowl champion, a 2006 Pro Bowler, and newly, and I mean newly appointed, Raiders head coach and my homeboy, Antonio Pierce. What's cracking, AP? Man, a lot. <laughs> a lot, man. Things are moving fast. Are, are they? I, I would assume they are moving fast considering you got to put your staff together. You got to figure out everything that you want to do. But at the same time, how's that going for you? Everything's going well. I mean, uh, putting the staff together is always a challenge. You got to retain them. You got to bring in some new guys. You got to let some guys go. Uh, you got to mix and match. It's kind of like putting a puzzle together. And you really don't know the final piece and what it's going to look like until you get them all in the same room. But I think we're putting guys together, uh, one, who are teachers, motivators, good people, reinforcing positive messages, and just having that mindset of what we're looking for within this Raiders culture. Yeah, you know, everybody's talking about your first opportunity to be a coach or whatnot. And, and obviously at Arizona State, she was a linebacker coach, moved to the defensive coordinator. Then you linebacker coach with the Raiders. And now you're the head coach with the Raiders. But miss me with all that because you were hired by me first as my defensive coordinator of my 707 team. So you part of my coaching tree. I just want everybody yeah. out there to know that Antonio <laughs> Pierce is officially part of my coaching tree. And one of the young men that you coach is my son, Keyshawn Jr., who joins us as well on the show, AP. Come on, man. It's good to see. Listen, you got to keep it within the family now, right? Yes, you sir. You got to keep it within. He, he's learning the right way. And I'll tell you, I remember on our 7-on-7 seven on seven, seven on seven team, young Key was a little bit younger now, and he was hanging with the older cats. You know what I mean? Those four and five stars we had. Well, we had a lot of five stars, but he made a name for himself, and obviously he had a good opportunity to go on to college and move on. Yeah, so I want to get started. So you guys both grew up in Southern California and played high school football in relatively the same area. Coach, you played at Paramount, and Dad, you played at Dorsey. Take us back to playing in the 90s in L.A. and what the culture was like. Go ahead, AP. Uh, well, I'll tell you, it might be a little different for Key. I mean, that block was a little bit more hotter over there. But for me, uh, playing in Paramount, uh, for Paramount High School, our rival was Dominguez High School. And, and that was a big-time rivalry, both on – the grass on the football field and then, on, you know, indoors for the basketball uh, team as well. But growing up in the 90s, man, it was all about the neighborhoods. You know, it was all about your friends and the guys you grew up with, whatever block you guys were on, what high school you went to, and then you go play that rival school, and it was on. Like, it was it was so intense, those certain rivalries, right? I mean, that, that Paramount, Dominguez, and then you go to other games, you know, the, the Bannon and Carson, Bannon and Dorsey, and Dorsey and Crenshaw, like those games, you said, man, come on. Like, you knew it was true hatred for one another. But more importantly, man, it was, it was all about bragging rights. It was all about when you went back home or you're chilling at the house with your boys and, and you guys say, man, I got y'all last Friday. I oh, mean, we'll see you in the playoffs. Well, I don't know if that's going to happen, but it was really good, and that kind of lasted throughout the year until you got to the hardware. Yeah, no, AP is right. It was, it, it was, it was going to Dorsey, it was hot. I mean, it was, it was one of the situations where – and there's no telling what might break out depending on the outcome of the game. You had to be ready for everything and all things, whether it was the lights being shot out because you were ahead 28 nothing, and they want to just end the game, or whether whether teams was intimidated because you, you were in an environment which we call the jungle, which is a bunch of apartment buildings right across the street from the high school. And so a lot of teams that would even come and play us <laughs> They didn't even want to come to play us. We, our school was one of the first schools to start to travel outside of Southern California to other cities just to be able to play, whether it was Sacramento or San Diego or Las Vegas, because teams within the city just didn't want to play us because we were both good and we were intimidating, but we are a highly educated school. Academics was at an all-time high. Guys got opportunities to go on and play in college and to the next levels. Like, we were producing them like this, like that. And at the end, you know, a lot of guys lost their lives along the way, but it was it was one of them situations. It was just a rough environment, a rough situation. You know, if you play, if you went to Audubon Junior High and you could play dual sports, basketball, and football, most likely you tried to go to Crenshaw or Pacific Palisades. If you was just a straight-up football player, you chose Dorsey. So I started at Palisades, at Palisades because I played both, and then I was like, I can't be out here with these people. It's too lame for me. I went back to Dorsey. 
And then both because it was more, it was just more my environment, son. It just was different. Different than Calabasas High, that's for sure. Was that a real story? <laughs> like really shooting up uh, your school oh, absolutely. at 28 zero? Yeah. Oh, yeah. We're going to turn the lights out oh, yeah. and go home. Oh. Yeah. So we're with. It was, no, I'll it, tell you what, we played Dominguez. We played yeah. Dominguez one year, and they locked the gates in. We were locked inside with the buses. Everybody went off. They turned the lights off, and all the gates were locked. Yep, and, and you know, like, oh, man. What, you, what's up next? You know how the track on the field is. They would bring in the opponents through the side gate and leave the buses on the field. So as soon as the game was over, wasn't no handshake and load the buses and get the hell out of Dodge because you wasn't going to beat us. So – we wanted to make sure you were intimidated with all the, it was just, it was, it was one of them situations where they filmed, yeah. where they filmed traffic, not traffic, where they filmed um, training day is across the street from my high school. Crazy. <laughs> okay. So coach Pierce, we found this soundbite from a broadcast earlier this season about your coaching style and approach. Take a listen. With Laura open for more on Antonio Pierce, head coach. Oh, I just want to say 27 nothing isn't enough for him because up 63 to 9 at halftime, Long Beach Poly High School head coach Antonio Pierce didn't like how the team looked. So instead of going into the locker room, he took them behind the field and they ran for 20 minutes. Gassers, they got a delay of game penalty because they were late for kickoff, but won 99 to 9. Back me up, guys. I brought up the story to Antonio. He didn't crack a smile saying oh, it's about man. doing it right, man. <laughs> no, there was no there was no mirth involved in that story. It was just straight up, well, yeah. <laughs> First out and ten. So where does this personality, this coaching personality come from? Well, I mean, it's not too far from within your bloodlines, you know? Your, your, your father who put me into this coaching world, we had no remorse for anybody we played in the seven on seven world. Yeah, there was no mercy when we did it, but uh, really where it started, man, it was just, you know, all gas, no brakes, kind of like what we're talking about here on the show. Instead of saying facts, no brakes, all gas, no brakes. And, right. you know, the team that I had at Long Beach Poly, uh, very talented team, a gentleman named Jack Jones was on that team, Amon Marshall, some other players. And um, the one thing about it, we had standards and expectations. And we were winning, obviously, you, saw, you heard about the score, but there was penalties, there was sloppy play. You know, we, I think we turned the ball over maybe twice, and, I, and it wasn't to our standard. So what I always told them, since they're not really taking it serious, then we'll go ahead and get another workout in at halftime. And we would literally run the entire 15 or 20 minutes, what it was back then, all the way up, got a delay game. And then the crazy part about it, they kicked off and ran back to kickoff. So obviously I didn't run them hard enough. But <laughs> the mentality is, man, when you got somebody down, you know how it is. You, you got to press all the way down on their throats. You can't let them breathe. And that's just the mentality when you want to have that, that team that's a bunch of uh, alphas and good players. But then because there's going to be a time where we're going to have to be the other way around. And we're going to have to fight and claw and scratch our way out of the situation. So just wanted to build that mental toughness. And by any means necessary, regardless of who we're playing, our standards and expectations don't change. You know, it's so funny, AP. I was watching, and I'm trying to – and I kept trying to remember the game. But once I said you're going to remember the game for me, you guys were – they were driving. It was late in the game. And the team was um, <laughs> about on the, I don't know, 10-yard line. And they just gained a couple yards. But you was trying to get the defensive dudes lined up. And you cussed the shit out the linebacker. You told him something. And I said, AP getting in his ass right now. And I said to Chargers. myself, it was a charger game. And I said mm -hmm. to myself, watch the next play. In the next play, they tacked, stuffed him in the backfield. Because mm -hmm. they responded to you at a certain level. And I said, well, that's how you coach people. And you know how everybody's always talking about, well, it's different now. It's not the same. I said, no, it's the it's it's who the message is coming from. How do right. you get the players to respond to you or gotten the players <clears throat> to respond to you in that matter, AP? Yeah, I think it's respect. Respect and accountability. I think they trust that, you know, I'm not going to tell them anything wrong or put them in a uh, situation where they look bad or we look silly. Um, and that started, you know, way before when I first got here two years ago as a linebacker coach, building those relationships. And it was both on and off the field. And once you gain that respect, you know, once you gain that respect and they know that you have their best interests for them, their career, their family, and then they all these dudes are trying to get paid to get what? They plan to get paid. And they want to be put in positions to do such. And when you go at them like that, it's not like I'm cussing at them in a, in a, a malicious way or yeah. 
I'm trying to make them like lower the standards and make them like I'm talking down to them. No, they just don't like, God damn it. That, that's not what we're doing. You know, and that was late in the game where we were up. Yeah, we were up big, but everybody wants to say, you know, the famous line, put me in, coach. Yeah. Well, that was our backups. But look, you're in. The standard and expectations doesn't change because you're in and they let their starters in. You, you're supposed to do this. This is how it's supposed to look. And I talk to our team about it should look right, it should sound right, it should smell right. And that doesn't change for anybody. From Max Crosby to the last man on our roster, there's a certain standard and a way of play that we want to have at all times. Okay, cool. Well, congrats, AP, first of all, on becoming the head coach, the new head coach of the uh, Las Vegas Raiders. But now that it's official, we need to get straight to the facts in a segment we like to call Facts or Fiction. Posts were circulating on Twitter the other day from you and Chad Johnson about 85 getting a team with, or a job with the team. Even Chad's wife didn't seem to believe him. So we need to know if it's facts or fiction. Was Ocho Cinco your first official hire to the Raiders coaching staff? That's fiction. But it is a fact that he has an open, we have an open door policy where he can come in, talk to our team. Obviously, look, Chad has done an outstanding job. I've known Chad since, hell, we was in uh, junior college back in Southern California. I've gone against them both in JUCO, uh, collegiate ranks, professional ranks. Hell, you saw there, we were there at uh, Carbone's eating food and dinner and he starts talking football and, you know, he's talking about he can work out and still run routes. And he said, you know what, even better, yeah, I can coach these guys up. So I said, listen, whenever you want to come in for, you know, a mini camp, a training camp, OTA, and, and work out with these guys, come on in. When you when you look yeah, at he, it, when you look at it, AP, you obviously took over for Josh McDaniels and you said to yourself, okay, I get this opportunity. Who did you reach out to outside of Marvin Lewis to kind of – get some sort of guidance as to how to move forward with the team? Well, Marvin was one of the first gentlemen I did reach out to. Uh, the second one was, and it's kind of odd, it's Tom Coughlin. Um, I was 26 years old when I signed there from the Washington Redskins at the time. And uh, like everybody on that team, we butted heads, right? And it wasn't always pretty with me and him. Our conversations were pretty heated at times. But there became a point in 2006 where we had a good sit down and I understood who the man was and what his purpose was, the message that he was speaking each and every week. And I got the true meaning behind it. I understood who the man was and the person was. And I really carried that on. And our relationship grew, obviously, through the 2007 year and on until I finished my career. And then even post, you know, playing and, and doing ESPN with you, Key, and other business adventures, I always reached out to him because here's a gentleman who's done it for over, you know, 20 years as a head coach in the National Football League. He started an organization with the Jacksonville Jaguars from ground up, got them going right away. Who else better than somebody that's done it at every facet of the game, you know, from a president to a GM to a head coach, coordinator, position coach, and the wisdom and the knowledge and really just to bounce things off of them. Of how would you approach this? How would you handle this? All right, this is what I'm thinking. Am I right? Am I wrong? And just to get that feedback, because at the end of the day, the decision always comes back to me. But there's nothing wrong with looking for guidance from people who have been there and done it. I talk to our players and our staff about checking their eagles at the door. Well, if I tell them that, I got to do the same thing. I'm not afraid to ask people who have done it and been there before me to see if I'm doing it the right way, because I don't want to fail in this situation. Makes sense. So we've recently seen a trend of black former players getting a coaching nod in the NFL from Gerard Mayo to Raheem Morris to D'Amico Ryan and, of course, now yourself. So compared to your white counterparts, as black men, do you feel the best way to become a head coach is by being a former player? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, I don't think that's the best way. I think, I think it's also about opportunities. I mean, when you look at it, how many black officer coordinators do we have? How many black quarterback coaches do we have? You know what I mean? I, I, it has to start there. There has to be a, a baseline where the growth develops from the office inside. I think the one thing you saw there and what you mentioned with myself, Mayo, and uh, D'Amico is that you talked about guys that were captains. They were leaders. They were the alphas on their team. Um, they demanded respect. They earned the respect by their work ethic, both on and off the field, in the classroom, calling out, making those tough, uh, decisions and conversations with their counterparts. But if you want to flip it to the other side, you need to see more growth with more African-Americans or minority coaches 
at the quarterback position and offensive coordinators. Um, they got all these rules in the National Football League. You got to buy by them. But what's really real? Are we really putting guys in position to move up? And then what is that? What's their opportunity? What's their career um, length as far as um, the amount of years they're given in case they have a bad year, for example? Like, do they get another shot? There's a couple of coaches that who are African-American who are not coaching currently. Um, I brought those gentlemen in for interviews and um, very, very qualified, you know, and it wasn't that I decided to go with somebody else, a, a white counterpart or a white coach. It was I went, I went with the best coach, the best fit for us, but they're well deserving of it. You know, gentlemen's like Eric B. Enemy, Byron Leftwich, Pep Hamilton, Hugh Jackson is another name that, you know, gentlemen I interviewed. Those gentlemen are all qualified and are ready to be in the NFL and as an offensive coordinator, head coach. It's all about timing as well. So uh, I don't think it really has anything to do with being a black linebacker coach or on a, a defensive side of the ball. I think you just see, if you look across the league, I'm sure there's more African-American black linebacker coaches than there are whites. Yeah, that, that could be true. You know, but you are with the right organization in the Raiders that, that set the standard, whether it was hiring Amy Trask back in the 80s or whether or not it was hiring the first current-day African-American coach in Art Shell or whether it was getting Hugh Jackson an opportunity once upon a time as the Raiders head coach in Oakland, and now you. Do you feel like, AP, though, that you have a certain standard and a responsibility that you need to, to live up to because you are one of us that is coaching at a high level? To spit, you know, when we have tried so hard to be put in this position? Yeah, no, there's a burden. I can feel it. But more importantly, Key, I think, you know, just like yourself, you're going to be who you are. And I'm in this position because I stay true to me. And I told Mark Davis that I expressed that to our staff, our players, our organization. You know, I am who I am. I talk how I talk. I act like how I act. But more importantly, I'm a professional. I, I've done my job. I've been put in this position because I busted my ass to get here. And then when I got the opportunity, I busted my ass to keep the opportunity, too. Mm -hmm. Now, the burden is when you look at it amongst players now, what I think what I'm feeling, a lot of my former players and teammates and guys I went against, they're like, oh, AP did it. I can do it. And they're right. But you still got to put in the work. You know, I'm still logging in 14, 16 hours. You know, you're still working on it consistently. This day, my job, I haven't had a day off. I haven't had an hour off. You know, this bad boy real now. Yeah. This bad boy real. It ain't stopping. And you really got to filter through all the weeds, right, of who really fits, what really matters. And what I told all the former players is, listen, I'd love to bring you in and do an internship. Or let you come along. Like, I've already hired, I believe, six former players on our staff. Deshaun Foster, Edgar Bennett, uh, Mike Caldwell, Ricky Manning, Gerald Alexander, Andre Carter. So there's great opportunities there. And I'm going to do the same thing as we grow forward within this organization. But when I look at gentlemen like Art Shell, Tom Flores, Sandra uh, Douglas, our president, Morgan Douglas, our president, I mean, we represent something that's different now. And it's, and it's starting to become uncommon. Is it there yet? No. But, damn, we just made a hell of a stride this offseason. Mm -hmm. Raheem, myself, uh, D'Amico last year, Mayo. I mean, and there was other candidates. Patrick Graham interviewed several times for head coaching jobs. So Aaron Glenn, you know what I mean? You just look at it. There's guys, it's coming along, but you got to keep doing the work. At the end of the day, I'm going to be judged off production, how I lead the team, and how we look each and every week going forward. And it really is going to come down to wins and losses. Now, I would say, based on everything you said, opportunity, giving guys opportunity, you gave a guy an opportunity that, that got a second opportunity. Well, maybe you want to call it a fifth opportunity or a tenth opportunity in Jack Jones. Jack has come to the Raiders and, and embraced that Raider culture, and he, he just looks like a Raider, acts like a Raider, play like a Raider. And I'm sure you're the one who signed off on Jack to come in because you recruited him, you had him in high school, you had him at ASU, and now you have him as a Raider. How did it feel to you to be able to reach down and grab one of your own and have him have the, mm -hmm. the, the short success that he's had thus far with the Raiders? I'm going to tell you, it goes back to even last year. As soon as I walked in the building, they said, hey, who did you coach at ASU that you think can play in the league? I said, Jack Jones. Oh, uh, man, you know, he got this, he got that. Well, I wasn't in a position to have any say. Obviously, I have enough clout in the room to make that decision. He got drafted uh, by the Patriots. But as soon as he hit that wire and I saw him come across, I ran right upstairs to our interim head, uh, GM, Champ Kelly. Say, Champ, he can help us. Oh, AP, I don't know, man. He got a lot of baggage. I said, oh, I know. Trust me. I know. I've been here for all of it. 
Then I went to Mark Davis. He's like, ah, I don't know, AP. Ah. Right now, you want to do that? So I let it kind of ride for about a couple hours. Went downstairs, did some more homework, watched some more film, researched a little bit more, went back upstairs. And at this time, it wasn't about asking. I'm pounding on the table. I said, you know what? I believe in him so much. If we have this up, get rid of both of us at the end of the season. Because I know what I'm getting with Jack Jones. First and foremost, Jack is not a bad kid. Excuse me. A young man. He's a father. He graduated from ASU. He's made decisions that we all made at certain times in our life that we wish we can go back. True. He has never hurt anybody. He's done nothing so criminal where he's put himself in position to be jailed. Now, he had, you know, a bad decision he made at the airport. That got cleared up. We moved on. Did our homework there. But when you put him in a culture and an environment where he can be taught, led, groomed, hugged, loved, disciplined, and you can keep recycling that cycle with him, you want to get the best out of him. And what you saw those last, whatever it was, six or seven weeks that he's with us, was just that. Because on the field, he's a problem. And that's in a good way. Ask the teams that he was picking off when he was reading those plays. The anticipation, anticipation skills and his ability to read and the love for the game is unmatched. Our swag level, as you want to say, went out the roofs when we put him in our second game. Everybody in that back end was trying to make plays studying film a little different, watching Jack Jones, how he operated in practice, because he did what he did in games, in practice. But all, like any, like any of us, Keith, you want somebody that believes in you. Yeah. And Jack knows I believe in him, he believes in me, and you want an opportunity. Now, Jack knows, this might be your last opportunity, but <laughs> we can't screw this one up. And he did a hell of a job for us at the end of the season. So we want to stay on the sticking with the topic of coaches. We have to get your take on Eric Bieniemy's pathway to the NFL and why he's yet to get a coaching job, head coaching job. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. Uh, back in 2019, it was probably my first interaction with EB on a professional coaching level. Um, when I was looking to sign with the Kansas City Chiefs as a linebacker coach, and we had some good conversation. And then obviously I watched EB for the next you know, two or three years with the Chiefs win titles, do very well, then not get an opportunity to be a head coach, move over to the commanders, and after one year, he's fired, brought him in, interviewed him for the OC position, and I can tell you this, he's qualified, he's a good teacher, he presents, he commands the room, he's a leader of men. Sometimes it's just, and Keith said it, it's being at the right place in the right time. I don't really understand the why it didn't work out for him in Kansas City to become a head coach. Most of those gentlemen who worked underneath Andy Reid at some point or later became a head coach. But Eric Bieniemy has those traits. And Key hit it on, Key, Big Key, you hit it on earlier. It's, it's his timing. It's the fit. It's like, who's looking for that? But I, And then also, you know, this too, Key, I, it could also pass you by. And that's yeah. the sad part about this game, you know, to be honest, you know, not just to go off the Eric Bieniemy deal, but look at Steve Spagnuolo. Look at the job he's done. Nobody's interviewed him for a head coaching job. That's crazy. And he's one of the best coordinators in football. So sometimes it comes down to timing. And you're starting to see a trend now where the owners are going with younger head coaches. Hey, I'm 45, and I'm in the middle of the pack. Yeah. How did you feel, speaking of Spags, how did you feel when you took the Raiders into Kansas City and got that W, man? How did you, how did you feel, though, flying back? That felt good, Key. I ain't gonna lie, man. That felt good. You know why? Because that first game, I think a lot of people kind of forget, we were up 14 nothing. And, you know, we had a couple of flaws on defense where we kind of let the, the floodgates open. And Patrick Mahomes and Andy Reid got rolling. They got rolling. They started making plays. And next thing you know, it's, what it was, 31-17. I'm like, God damn, what happened? So I said, like, this time we're not going to do it. You know, we're going to jump on them early, which I knew, I felt we could. But I wanted to overwhelm with our energy, our passion, our physicality, mentally, emotionally. I told Max to make sure he touched 15 every play. I made sure, I told Jack and our DBs, make sure you're out there wolfing. As you're making plays, you're calling out plays. We're playing that mind game with them. And from the offensive side of the ball, I wanted to be as physical as possible. You know, when you go against the Spags defense, you know he's going to bring pressure. Well, I think I know it pretty, pretty well. And when he brings pressure, you need to run right into the teeth of it and right down the middle of it. And that's what we did. And then at the end of the game, what I call no fair dodging, 21-22 personnel, here it comes. Man up, strap up. And the best part about it, man, our guys really, they were like looking forward to that. That was a cool part about that game. They were looking forward to that opportunity where we were talking about four-minute mode, finishing the game, not allowing Patrick Mahomes to get the ball at the end of the game to work out some kind of magic. 
and to go in Arrowhead on Christmas Day when I know everybody was watching, right? We was the first bad boy on that day, basketball, football, and uh, the way the game went was beautiful. Yeah, so you very notably turned around the culture in Vegas this past season, gaining the trust and respect of all your players. Take a listen to what Max Crosby had to say during your hiring process. If it happens again, what does that mean for your future uh, as a Raider? If they do um, not go with AP. Yeah, I mean, it's something I'm going to have to, re, you know, consider everything. You know, I, I, honestly, nothing's off the table. Um, clearly, I've made it very, I made it loud and clear that I want to be a Raider for life. I want to be here. I want to win here. I want to retire here. Um, but, I mean, if you go and start from scratch again, um, I mean, I, I, I got to consider everything. So how does it feel to have your star player go to bat for you like that in your job? It's pretty cool, I'll tell you that. Uh, because, you know, his voice and what he says carries a lot of weight, not only in our locker room, but with our staff and, in, and within our building. And obviously our owner heard it as well. Uh, you respect somebody that does that. Obviously, Max, what he does on the grass, what he does in the community, on and off the field. Uh, he's a true Raider, true professional. He's only getting better and better. And me and Max have a really good relationship. That started, again, back at the beginning. Max Crosby was the first player to introduce himself when I walked in that, that building. But I think more importantly, what Max was doing was he wasn't just speaking for Max Crosby. He was speaking for the locker room. He was speaking for other people who were having side conversations with him. And said, look, I got an opportunity. I got a platform to speak, and I'm going to do it. And I really don't care what the consequences are going to be. Now, I gave Max a call and said, hey, man, let's, <laughs> let's make sure we know who we're talking to and, and who's listening to these messages and be respectful of it. But obviously, for him to do that speaks volumes. Uh, the, the support and the love that I have for Max, and I think vice versa, is critical, I think, for our team. Because when you see a head coach and his star players aligned, that just filters down to the bottom. And that goes not just the bottom of the roster, but throughout the entire building. You know, AP... You won some games with the Raiders, but you also lost some close games. You 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 was right there at, at winning those games. I watched the Miami game. Y'all had Miami on the ropes. They let that one get away. But at any time during this whole process, did you ever feel like, I earned this opportunity to be the head coach, but I might not get it? Did you ever feel that, like, you're going to get an interview and that's pretty much it? I'll be honest, after the Minnesota game, I was disappointed. You know. We had those two losses. We started off season, as you know, we're not start off season, but start over when I when I took over with two wins. Then we followed that up with a tough loss against the Dolphins and then the Chiefs. And then we went into the bye week. And I thought we prepared well. I thought we had a good plan going into that game. And listen, we wasn't no offensive juggernaut by any means. I get it. But to score zero against a team that was struggling as well, defensively pretty good, really good. Had a good scheme. But to score zero at home at their bye week, I, I felt – I did. I felt a little pressure. I felt like, God damn, what, what did I do wrong? What happened? Like, what was the message that I didn't get across to our players or our staff to put out a performance like that? Now, on the flip side, if we won 3 nothing. it would have been a hell of a job by our defense, right? Uh, but it didn't go that way. And then the next week, we only had four days to prepare, really three, to prepare for the Chargers at home. And I'm like, man, whatever we got to do, we got to score. So literally what I did – that Monday after the Minnesota game, I told everybody you got the building for an hour. I said, go home, call the fam, go walk the dog. I don't care what you do, but come back and hit the reset button. Because I don't want to talk about Minnesota no more. I don't want to feel about I don't want to feel any like remorse about what had happened. And let's focus on how we're gonna beat these Chargers. And I did the same thing with our players. And then I told them like this. I said, you know what? Let it loose. I don't care. If you believe that's a good play, call it. If that's something that goes against our analytics, I don't care. If that's in your gut, call it. And our office, between the office and coordinator, Bo, defensively, especially, I mean, everybody was rocking and rolling that day, Keith. And I felt better. But really, to be honest with you, that Minnesota game, yeah, that was a little, I was a little nervous after that one. I'm like, God damn. That, I know we didn't need that one. <laughs> Not at the house. I'm like, no. I, I, I was on. nervous. Trust me, I was nervous for you. <laughs> I said, oh, boy. So I want both of your opinions on a recent NFL storyline. Chiefs receiver Kadarius Toney has been in the headlines after going on Instagram Live ahead of the AFC Championship game. Toney didn't hold back in expressing his frustration with being placed on injured reserve, claiming he was healthy. 
And ahead of Super Bowl 58, he doubled down on his frustrations. Dad, if you were a teammate of Tony's, how would you receive this? And coach, how would you handle this? Well, if he was my teammate, first thing I'd tell him is don't just, you know, we know what's going on. Don't, don't. NFL teams, they play a lot of games. Now, I don't know that Andy Reid was playing any games, but sometimes the communication can get lost, son. Okay, now the kids say he was healthy enough to play. Maybe he felt that way, and maybe the training staff felt like he wasn't healthy enough to play. You know, and and so in the end, you try to tell him as a teammate, just just chill, man, because what you don't want to do is you don't want to derail your opportunity. You already got traded from the Giants because he didn't live up to their expectations, and now all of a sudden you got Andy Reid, you going up against the Kansas City Chiefs, and you're winning football. It's not like you're losing games, you're winning games. So I would just tell him, just, just, just chill, man. Just, just relax. And, and, and it's hard for guys that want to be competitive and they get frustrated and all of those sort of things. But sometimes, you know, organizations tend to ignore that and they put their own stuff out there. So I'm kind of like both of them could have been in the right and both of them could have been in the wrong. I think it's always tough. Whenever you go to social media or you go to you know, different outlets to express yourself, it can be uh, – you can mislead people a lot of different directions. And then to me, when it's stuff that's in-house, man, do your best to keep it in-house. Both Key and myself played in New York, and, and he's fortunate he doesn't have that kind of media around him where they'll just grab all on top of him and eat him up. But, you know, I would love for a player or a coach that if you got a problem with somebody in the building, man, you, you man up. You either come upstairs, talk. You call me, but we figure it out before we go, you know, through social media. Now, I get it. That's kind of the outlet and the platform that a lot of athletes and other people use. I still think there's a place where things need to stay in-house, and that's a situation where, listen, we went up against Tony. He's a problem. You don't want to face him. And I'm sure the Chiefs want him active because when he has the ball and he's in the game and everything's going right, they're rolling offensively pretty well. So, you know, that, that's really something I wish they could handle in-house. It's something I wouldn't want to happen here. We had that discussion as soon as I took over. I said, hey, man, if we got any problems, and hey, we close these doors right here, we'll figure it out. And we're not going to open them until we figure it out. Hopefully, we keep everything in-house. You know, and, and AP is, is speaking from experience. And, and myself, being a fiery player at times throughout my career, I didn't need to go to the media. I had no problem talking to the coaches and sitting them down in the office and, and explaining to them why I felt a certain way. And if they didn't feel that that was right, just let me know. And then we'll move on from there. But we, what we're not going to do is we're not going to have the coaches leaking stuff to the press, and I ain't going to leak stuff to the press, and we're going to keep it moving. Okay. So the other day on the show, my dad and I discussed our Super Bowl memories from 2002 when he beat the Oakland Raiders. No disrespect, all love. But, Coach, <laughs> you want to ring with Eli and the Giants in 08. Walk us through your best memories from that experience. That right there, when that confetti comes down, there's nothing like it. He knows exactly what I'm talking about. It's a surreal moment. You don't know what to do. You kind of watch players and teams before you celebrate. You get the goggles. You get the champagne. You run the stands. You grab the family. You know, you don't know who's going to interview. Then you want to run on stage. You want to grab the Lombardi. Like, there's so much going on that – at the end of the day, the one thing I really took in was just looking up in the air and was watching that confetti coming down and just, and you know, it's just paper, right? It's like, <laughs> it ain't nothing. But it's just that feeling of something you've been waiting your whole life to see, you see on television and to be a part of it and have that, that rain of confetti coming down on you and just to see the joy and excitement from everybody. Like, it's, it's like, I don't know how you explain it more than saying, like, it's like being in the clouds, man. Like, it's like being at Disney World by yourself. And you don't have to wait in no lines, right? <laughs> you just go all over the park and it's all yours. And you're just looking around and it's like, this can't be real. And then it's not until later that night you really pinch yourself and you say, damn, I'm a world champion. And that's for life. Mm -hmm. Were well, you going to be at the, the Super Bowl this weekend? Yeah, I'll be there probably up until halftime. I'm going to watch the Usher halftime and I'm out. Yeah. <laughs> But you got you you hey party I, I know part of your deal AP you got the big old sweep the box and all that right? Yeah, not for Super Bowl that bad boy. No no not not, not no no I'm talking about for y'all season the regular season. 
Because I can't come oh, to yeah, the, yeah. I can't come to no, the I game. Got you. See, yeah, okay. I got you. I, I told be, you. Yeah, I can't be sitting in those stands, I, no, man. No, Lil' Key, I got you too, man. Uh, I got yeah. you. Junior, we good. <laughs> yeah, we right, going. Just, come on, man. I'm just making sure because I know everybody. No, you, you know, good. you done play with a lot of dudes and been around a lot of dudes. I just want to make sure I got a seat when I come to the no, game. No, no, That's all. No, man. You got, yeah, you got birds off you, baby. You right there. Okay. I got you. Right. Is it is it weird seeing the Chiefs at your home field right now, like practicing there, like as rivals? It's your stadium, your city. Is that weird for you? It's weird knowing that they're doing it. I haven't had a chance to be up there. We kind of we're locked out, so to say, from our own building. Yeah. Uh, but the cool part about it, I will say this: when they walk in here, all they do is see the silver and black. We do got a couple of our uh, uh, trophies and other things that we put up uh, from when we beat them. We put up like these little like photos and stuff. So I'm sure they've seen that walking around. But mm. listen, man, it's only temporary. Just remember this: the last time, the last team to beat them was who? Yeah, yeah, the Raiders. <laughs> See, I'm a Raider fan again. I, I obviously I grew Come up in on. LA and was a Raider. Then they moved to Oakland. I still support the Raiders, but now I'm I'm deep silver and black now because of you. Other than that, I ain't really wherever my <laughs> nephew go, wherever my nephew go yeah. to play, I'm a fan of that. But my second team is gonna be the Raiders for sure, hundred percent. Appreciate that. Well, before you get out of here, you know, on these shows we like to get people's all time list in Mount Rushmores. So we gotta ask, who's your Mount Rushmore of linebackers? Mm. That's simple, man. I grew up Mike Singletary, mm. Ray Lewis, Lawrence Taylor, Derrick Brooks. Okay. Yeah, that's 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 about right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, no, they're, they're I mean, we, like, we we didn't. I mean, we didn't watch Dick Buckus play. Like nah. we got a chance to see Mike Singletary. We got a chance. Obviously, I played with Brooks. Yeah, that's that's about right. Yeah, I would say the that. The two guys could go either way. You know, you'll say Lawrence Taylor and Derrick Brooks, you know, say they're, you know, outside linebackers, DNs. But, man, they, I mean, that was special to watch those two players. Man, I can't, AP, man, I can't thank you enough for joining me and my son on this podcast. But also, just know I'm going to be in Raider Nation once minicamp opens up. Your boy will be right there with you with no problem at all. All right? That's I a got wrap. you, baby. I got both of y'all. I got you. I got you. I got okay. young kid, too. We good. <laughs> all right. That's a wrap. Today, appreciate my guy, Antonio Pierce, for joining the show. Don't forget to subscribe and follow All Facts Podcast on social media. Until then, it's Keyshawn. Peace. Now, remember, he was my DC. He's part of my coaching tree. I want y'all to remember that.